Hi, this is the first of several videos developing a quantum substratum. The goal is to visualize quantum theory in a way that is not weird. What do I mean by a substratum? Well, I recommend that you first check out my video, Edge of Knowledge, where we compare a medium like air to a substratum like the electromagnetic field. There we define a medium as something that is made of smaller parts that we know about, like air molecules. On the other hand, the substratum behaves like a medium, but if there are smaller parts, they are hidden from us. Now in this video, we'll describe a quantum substratum with local dynamics. We'll use it to visualize entanglement, and we'll see how we can violate Bell's inequality, even though it is local. If this seems to contradict common wisdom, we'll make the point that locality depends on the point of view. Let's get started. First, let's look at a membrane, like a soap bubble or a drum skin. It has two dimensions, X and Y. If we zoom in on the membrane, we can think of it as being made of little particles connected by springs. The springs like to arrange themselves in such a way that the energy in the springs is minimized. After minimization has finished, the membrane has settled into a shape described by this equation, which is called Laplace's equation. In physics, we often have things that behave as if they were made of particles and springs, even if they are not. Then we don't call the energy an energy. Instead, we call it the Lagrangian, and we use the symbol L instead of E. Let's fix the boundary so the membrane cannot move. And then we'll grab a piece of the membrane in the middle and lift it up. Next, we'll let the membrane settle. In other words, the springs will minimize their energy or their Lagrangian. To keep track of progress, we'll add a clock that measures time, capital T. Ready? Here we go. The boundary conditions don't have to be zero. And we can again have an internal condition. We see that when we change the condition, that change spreads out from that location. It is not an instantaneous effect. This is called locality. The root of this locality is in the springs. Each particle is only connected to its immediate neighbors. So when we change the location of a particle, the effect first spreads to its neighbors, then to their neighbors, and so on. Now, because this grid has two dimensions, I'll use the word two locality. More on that later. So this blue surface was a Laplace membrane using regular linear springs. Let's change to a different surface. We'll change the nature of the surface by changing the springs in the y direction. Instead of a plus sign, we'll have a minus sign to make it a kind of negative spring. And when we change the Lagrangian, we automatically change the equation, which is now called the wave equation. Let's fix the boundary on one side and give it a shape. So now what happens when we let the surface settle to minimize the Lagrangian? Let's see. The two bumps move in the x direction as we go deeper into the y direction. So then, should we call the direction y? It is a two-dimensional surface in space, which is why we use x and y. But for the wave equation, we often interpret one dimension as being time-like. So let's change the label to be little t. The idea is that if you were a creature living inside the surface, you'd have one space dimension and experience the other dimension as time. But we, outside the surface, we just see two dimensions of space. Our time dimension is indicated by the clock, capital T, which we call external time in contrast to the internal time experienced inside the surface. 
more on this later. One thing to notice with this linear wave equation is superposition. The two bumps move right through each other as if the other didn't exist. There is no interaction. Let's look at two other cases for the wave equation. With this surface, we don't have to fix a boundary. For example, we can fix the middle instead. Now what happens when the surface settles? We get a wave spreading both forward and backward in the dimension little t. And we can do things like fixing both a boundary and a point inside. In this case, the conditions over-determine the wave equation, so the solution is not quite that of the wave equation, but we can still minimize the Lagrangian given the conditions. Does this seem goofy? After all, we know that the surface is solving for the wave equation, and it seems strange to have waves propagate backward in internal time. On the other hand, to us, the surface is only minimizing a Lagrangian it can do whatever it needs to do. So, Laplace and wave surfaces. That's old stuff. Let's look at an interesting surface. Instead of using linear springs, we'll use nonlinear springs. And then the equation also becomes nonlinear. Why is this interesting? Well, there are three new phenomena that we get with nonlinear springs. The first is that we can get particle-like behavior. Here is a one-dimensional string with a nonlinear wave equation called the sine gordon equation. The solution is called a breather or a soliton. Notice that the energy is trapped in one region of space. It doesn't have to propagate. In contrast, a linear string only has solutions that propagate. So the breather can sit still like a particle. In addition, it can move, and when it does, it contracts and time dilates and desynchronizes. So it behaves as a massive particle in special relativity. In addition, it can accelerate in the direction of lower potential, like particles in curved spacetime. I talk more about breathers in my videos on relativity. So let's go back to our surface and see the second feature of nonlinear dynamics. Remember that for the linear surface, the bumps did not interact. They passed right through each other. So what happens now? Well, they changed direction. They bounced. The nonlinearity made them interact. And without interaction, physics would get very boring. Now on to the third feature of nonlinearities. The setup looks very similar to before, but notice what happens just after the particles interact. Did you see that? There was a wave spreading back from the interaction point. Once the two bumps interact, there are effects spreading both forward and backward in internal time. It reminds me a bit of the linear case, where we had a fixed condition in the middle. For the nonlinear surface here, we don't actually fix a point, but at the interaction, it's as if one particle imposes a bit of a condition on the other particle. So let's use this square button to indicate an interaction point. Let's run that again. Now everything is in place to visualize entanglement. In addition to the two particles that we just saw interact, we'll have two more particles for later interactions, or if you like, measurements. So what happens? As before, the two particles in the middle interact. Meanwhile, the outer particles are sitting still, waiting to interact later. Here we interact with one of the middle particles. We measure its state. Now watch as this interaction ripples back to the first one. Meanwhile, 
the particles on the right interact. Let's continue to watch the first ripple. The ripple arrived at the first interaction point, where the first two particles get entangled. It shifts the interaction a little bit, and then watch as the effect ripples along the right branch. All the interaction points will keep shifting until the surface finally settles in for good. Let's run that one more time without stopping. We see that the two later interactions influence each other via the point of entanglement. From our external point of view, the dynamics of the surface is local, or too local. But what about the internal point of view? Well, we can put some light cones at the two later interactions. The light cones are the green things at the far end of the surface. The two points influence each other, even though they are outside each other's light cones. In other words, for anyone living inside the surface, the behavior is non-local. The situation here with four particles is essentially the EPR paradox. But let's be more explicit. Again, we look at two dimensions, one in space and one in time. But we'll show the particles with spin explicitly. And then we have two spin detectors recording spin up or spin down. The particles move forward in time. The particles were perfectly aligned from the beginning, so nothing interesting happens. Next, we'll rotate the spin of the particles. Now as the particles move, they will be misaligned with the detectors. But the detector and particle want to be aligned. We can model this in the Lagrangian, adding a cost to misalignment. So the spin needs to rotate. As we continue to settle, the new rotation will spread both forward and backward in internal time. Now the second particle has arrived at its detector, so it also needs to align itself. And finally, the early history of the second particle will have the spin realigned. Let's run that again without stopping. Now in this case, the two detectors have the same alignment. What happens if the detectors are not aligned? This is where we get the EPR paradox and violate Bell's inequality. Let's see what happens. As before, the particle aligns with the detector. And as before, the new alignment will propagate back to the point of entanglement and then continue up the other branch. Now here at the second detector, we end up with some tension in the Lagrangian. Exactly what happens next depends on how we model the misalignment. There's likely to be some sloshing back and forth between the two detectors until we settle into a final state. One way to reproduce quantum mechanics is for the Lagrangian to penalize all misalignment equally. Then the Lagrangian would be minimized by having one of the particles being perfectly aligned and the other choosing an exit state by Born's rule, which we will deal with in a later video. Let's run that again without stopping. Let's summarize what we have done so far. We have a quantum substratum that is a scalar field on space-time. This field should not be confused with quantum fields, nor with the wave function. We'll see in a later video how those might arise from the substratum. The field is local from our external point of view. The field is nonlinear, and this can lead to three useful behaviors, namely particles, interactions, and retrocausation toward the initial condition. This in turn 
helps us understand entanglement, the apparent non-locality, and the EPR paradox. I need to point out here that we have experimented with nonlinear Lagrangians and demonstrated the behaviors, and we do have analytic solutions for moving breathers. However, the orange surfaces do not correspond to any Lagrangian yet known. These particular surfaces are fictional and only meant to visualize the behaviors. To me, the message of quantum mechanics is that we live in a block universe. I had planned to discuss that in this video, but the video is getting too long, so I'll do that in the next one. And there's much more to explore with a quantum substratum. Breathers can help us visualize quantization and orbitals and particle creation and much more. Then there's measurement and the question of where the Schrodinger equation comes from. Again, coming up with a specific Lagrangian that reproduces all the effects is a major research program. Nonlinearities are hard and much of the work is likely to be numeric. At the end of this series, I will outline all the blanks that need to be filled in. But this will not stop us from visualizing how such a substratum could make quantum physics more sensible. I'll see you in the next video. For more videos, go to physicsisnotweird.com and I'm Aiden Bernander.